Thank you for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdell, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's April 2021, and you're listening to episode 233, which is a conversation about the Christian and sexual sin. Today's guest is Dr. Clay Jones, who is a visiting scholar for the Masters in a Christian Apologetics Program at Talbot Seminary. He is also the chairman of the board of Ratio Christi, a university apologetics ministry, and the author of the book, Immortal, How the Fear of Death Drives Us and What We Can Do About It. Clay has written an article for our Viewpoint column, and Viewpoint articles are opinion pieces that address relevant contemporary issues in discernment, apologetics, and Christian discipleship from a particular perspective that is usually not shared by all Christians. We hope the intended result is that Christian thinking on an issue will be stimulated and enhanced whether or not readers end up agreeing with the author. Clay's article is in the current Volume 44, Number 1 print edition of the Christian Research Journal, and his article is called, You Probably Aren't Saved If This Is About Sex. You can read his article when you subscribe to our journal at Equip.org. Clay, it's good to have you on. Glad to be with you again, Melanie, as always. So Clay has written a very provocative opinion piece in our Viewpoint column in the current print edition of our journal that I mentioned. And specifically, as I said, his article is called, You Probably Aren't Saved If This Is About Sex. So that sounds very provocative. What made you want to write about this subject matter? You know, what made me want to write about it is that I've seen so many people interviewed especially in reality TV. And no, I don't watch The Bachelor and I don't watch those kind of, but you know, I mean, I watch different kinds of reality programming and I'll see people talk about Jesus. I'll see couples talk about Jesus and talk about being saved and talk about even loving the Lord and and, and things like that. And at the same time, they won't be shy about the fact that they've been sleeping around. And I understand I understand that sincere Christians sin. I understand that sincere Christians sin sexually. I get it. But there shouldn't be a thing of an attitude towards sleeping around where it's like, yeah, yeah, we do it like nonchalant. They're nonchalant about it instead of going, yeah, that was wrong. That was sin. They don't recognize it that way. And I've seen that so often that I've gone, you know, these people just don't seem to care. And a lot of people, it seems to me, a lot of people who call themselves Christians are just sexually immoral. In fact, one of pastors in our church who used to be the men's pastor at Saddleback for 25 years, he wrote a blog entitled something like how we have a lot of Christian sexual atheists. And and the premise of his article, and that went viral, got a million views. He says the premise of his blog was that people are calling themselves Christians and they are sleeping around just like the world does. And thus the title of my article, though, I, I disagree with that adamantly, where I said, you probably aren't saved if this is about sex. There's something wrong with that because the Lord doesn't allow us, the scripture forbids us to go around and just be engaging in sexual encounters with people we're not married to. But if you do, you should really feel bad about that because that's a sin and you surely shouldn't be talking about it nonchalantly because it's a sin. I think that notion seems to some people to, you know, be head scratching that like, it's what people do. I mean, that's what this younger generation does. Although I would say maybe older generations thought that too, especially when you think of the sexual revolution, particularly in the 1970s. But specifically in your article, I wanted to ask you about this. You wrote this quote, I suspect that my writing, you probably aren't saved if you're living in overt, unrepentant sexual sin will baffle or upset many people, end quote. And I would think that maybe people would say that because I don't think they'd say, well, it's unrepentant sexual sin. I'm just like, you know, that's just kind of how people live. They just have sex, you know, with whoever they're dating. And especially I think of in light of, you know, the new phenomenon of meeting people online, like you would never have known these people, but you might meet somebody, you know, in your same state, but farther away from you that you'd meet online. And a lot of times when people are doing that, they're using it to find people to have sex with. So what do you think saying those 
living in, as you say, quote, unrepentant sexual sin, end quote, means, is the person probably not saved? Why would that upset Christians? You know, if most Christians say, well, hey, that's what I do. I date people and then we, you know, sleep together. Yeah, indeed. And I, I do, sadly, frankly, find that to be the case. But that's not what the Bible teaches. We need to conform our sexual morality to what the Bible says. And we cannot just be sleeping around in unpromiscuous, un, or in promiscuous, shouldn't say unpromiscuous, promiscuous, unrepentant sex. We should be doing what the Bible says. And so I, I, I'm sad and baffled. And frankly, I think a lot of these people just simply aren't saved. I think a lot of them aren't Christians in the first place. I think that they're cultural Christians. Uh, they're Christians who may have prayed the prayer when they were young. And so they go, yeah, yeah, I'm saved because I prayed the prayer and I'm a Christian. I go to church and I'm just sleeping around because that's what everybody does. Everybody's doing it. We live in a pornographic world. So what do you expect? Of course, I'm sleeping around. Well, I'm sorry, but you probably aren't saved if that's you. Well, I'm sure that just saying that might make people feel a little defensive as they're <laughs> yeah. listening to this podcast. But in your article, you specifically quote this passage from the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 5, and it's verses 3, 5, and 6. And I'll just go ahead and read those verses. It says, quote, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words for because of these things, the wrath of God has come upon, comes upon the sons of disobedience, end quote. So how does this passage inform this conversation? Because this passage seems very, you know, hardcore to some people. What? <laughs> no inheritance in the kingdom of God in Christ. I believe in Jesus. I love Jesus. Especially, I would say, if younger people are listening to this, they see the culture. Like you said, there's all kinds of, quote unquote, famous pop, you know, icons or actors or whatever. And it's very evident that, you know, by their attitudes or what they say, they're sleeping around, but it's known that they go to church or they, you know, say, I love Jesus and those kinds of things. So how can you be saying that someone like that who says they love Jesus won't go to heaven? Well, it's again, I just back to the verse, Paul says, for this, you can be sure everyone who's sexually immoral or impure covetous. And by the way, if you read commentaries on this, they're talking about the commentators basically agree that we're talking about a sexual covetousness. We're talking about idolizing other people, wanting to own or possess them as objects, that no one who's immoral or impure has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ or of God. I don't know how that could be clearer. And then Paul goes on and says, as you quoted, Melanie, let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of such things, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. What are the empty words? The empty words are, I prayed the prayer. The empty words are, yes, I'm sleeping with whoever I want to, but I'm a Christian. Paul is saying those are empty words. Yeah, but I'm born again and I go to church. Those are empty words. I don't know how Paul could make it more clear than to say, be sure of this. Let no one deceive you of empty words, with empty words. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon who? Those who are sexually immoral and impure. I don't know how he could make it more clear than that. And so we need to get in line with what Paul tells us and what the scripture tells us. And we're not supposed to be living lives of sexual impurity. I know it's hard. I get it. But Christians are called to deny themselves, pick up their cross and follow Jesus. And one of the ways, maybe the biggest way in this age that we deny ourselves is by keeping ourselves sexually pure. Well, I know that there are people that will say, you know, I considered myself a Christian. I mean, I love God. I, you know, in junior high or high school or college or whatever, I raised my hand. I went forward, you know, when made an altar call and I prayed the prayer. I said, Jesus, you know, I accept Jesus into my heart. So I feel like I'm saved. That's what some people would say. And so how do you address them? And I do want to note that it, boy, it's been a long time, Clay, several years, but Clay was one of the, our first guests on this podcast because this is episode 233. But back on episode 30, Clay and I had a discussion about 
evangelizing the cultural Christian. But would somebody like that be a cultural Christian if they say, look, I prayed the prayer, I go to church, and I accepted Christ into my heart? Well, I'll tell you, and this is something that's extremely close to my heart, Melanie, an awful lot, put sex aside just a minute, a lot of people are only cultural Christians. The Pew Center, and I mentioned this in the article that you just referenced, the Pew Center said 71% of Americans self-identify as being Christian, 71% of Americans. Now that's going down, I understand that, but still a lot of people self-identify as being Christians. An awful lot of people, in fact, I think it was two thirds, will identify themselves as having beliefs that you would consider to be evangelical. They're not. You know, Jesus said, everybody likes to quote the words, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Uh, Even non-Christians will say, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. They love that saying. Here's the words that precede that. If you abide in my word, then you really are my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And what I find is, is that an awful lot of people who call themselves Christians, they don't abide in his word. And if you're not abiding in his word, then you're not conforming yourself to the image of Christ. And so I think, again, I think this is just what Paul was calling empty words. Yeah, yeah, I know I'm not living according to the Bible standard of sexuality and what the Bible tells us we should do, but I'm really a Christian and I love Jesus. Those are empty words. And how many, I just, I see all the time, you know, famous singers will sing all these songs about Christianity, but you look at their life, I mean, like, They'll do albums, Christian albums. It seems like if they're a famous singer, sooner or later they'll do a Christian album. And you look at their life and you go, I don't see anything in you that makes me think that you're actually born again, that you're actually saved. You're not abiding in God's word. They're certainly not disciples of Jesus. And so, I, you know, to me, saying I, you know, saying all these things is just exactly the empty words that Paul was talking about. Well, specifically in your article, you mentioned you note non-lordship salvation. And well, it's been a while since the whole even issue of lordship salvation was kind of an issue in certain parts of evangelicalism. Not all traditions within evangelicalism had that kind of debate. I guess it depended on, you know, certain theological views with which that would come up in those groups. But why don't you tell our listeners about what that is and why you think that that's like an error to say non-lordship salvation. In other words, I don't have to, as long as I accept Christ, I don't really have to. Christianity, we are in grace. Christianity is not about following a bunch of of laws that Jesus died for. That's right. You know, you're, you're absolutely right that a lot of people, in fact, I'm sure many of the people listening to this podcast have probably never even heard the phrase non-lordship salvation. My experience is having been in the evangelical community now for, this is a little, well, now you know how old I am. I've been a Christian for 51 years. I became, so you can figure this out. I became a Christian two days before I turned 13. So now you know how old I am. You know, I'm in my forties. Anyway, uh, <laughs> kidding. Anyway, I've been in the Christian community a long time. And what I find is, is that even though people may not use the phrase or be familiar with the tagline, non-lordship salvation, they have somehow adopted that. And I have been one of the, unfortunately, when I was a younger Christian, I was a part of that. I would say to non-Christians when I was a young Christian, I'd say, pray this prayer and you'll be saved. And I really meant that. Hey, pray this prayer, pray the sinner's prayer and you'll be saved. And I think there's a tremendous, well, I know there's a tremendous amount of Americans who have heard that if they pray this prayer, that they will be saved. And they may not identify with the phrase non-lordship salvation, but they they believe, hey, I'm just saved because I prayed the prayer. But non-lordship salvation was an official, actually, it kind of came out of Dallas Theological Seminary and, and in particular, Charles Ryrie of the Ryrie Study Bible, that you literally did not have to have Jesus be the Lord of your life and you could still be saved. In other words, you didn't have to do what he said. You could just believe in him and you would be saved. That is just utterly false. I I mean, Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your lips, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Confessing with your lips that Jesus is Lord means you actually think he's Lord. Lord of what? Lord of your life. The idea that you could go, well, I can just believe in him and get salvation from him, but I don't have to make him the Lord of my life. What do you believe in? 
that's my question for people that say that. Well, but what are you believing in? What kind of Jesus are you believing in? Because the only kind of Jesus that I know that you can believe in is the one who is God the Son, who died on the cross for your sins and was raised from the dead and is coming back to judge the world. And if you don't, that's that's the Lord, right? The Lord who said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross daily and follow me. That's what the Lord says. And so if you're going to believe that in that Jesus, the Jesus who says he's Lord, the Jesus who says he must be obeyed, then we need to get on board with that. By the way, one more thing. Everybody loves the Great Commission. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. People like that's called the Great Commission. Dallas Willard named the next line the Great Omission. And the next line is teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. Anyway, I think non-lordship salvation, frankly, is, is heretical. I think it's desperately sinful. And it's it's not only utterly false, and now I'm going to offend some people, it's stupid. It's a failure to understand the nature of who Jesus really is. So I know what you're thinking. Come on, Clay, tell us what you really think. We're all adults here. But it's a terrible, terrible notion. It's heretical, and we need to jettison it. But like I say, a lot of people listening to this may not officially hold to that, but they are practically holding to it. And they're going, yeah, yeah, I prayed the prayer, and so I'm in. It doesn't really matter how I live. It does matter. Stop it. Well, I do want to, before we break, bring up these verses in Romans 6, which says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. And in in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And it goes on to say in verse six, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin may be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So I think people who might say that might not be as familiar with scripture as they should. Be. Exactly. And that goes back to my point of people are not abiding in God's word and they're not trying to do what it says. They're not abiding in his word. They don't even know his word. How many people are calling themselves Christians that honestly don't read the Bible, hardly ever. They read it for a few minutes in church. In fact, they don't even open their own Bible anymore. They read it on the screen. And so they don't know what the Bible says, and they're just going along, you know, happy-go-lucky, thinking they're going to heaven when they're not actually doing what Jesus says. And also, I would note that when people say, well, hey, I prayed the prayer and I go to church, I think if you were to really dig into that statement, I go to church, it is probably not weekly. Because the people who do go to church weekly, that are in a small group Bible study, they're in the life of the church, they would for sure know that this is not what the Bible teaches, that well, we could continue in a life like this. If it's a good church, if it's not, you know, I mean, some of these progressive churches, I mean, you're not going to hear anything. But yeah, if it's a solid church, yeah, I would agree with you. Yeah. I mean, that's people are in a healthy, well-balanced church, as we talk about at CRI. You're listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest is Dr. Clay Jones, who's written an article in our Viewpoint column for our print edition of Volume 44, Number 1. You can read his article. You probably aren't saved if this is about sex when you subscribe to our magazine at equip.org. And I do want to thank our listeners for writing a review for us on Apple Podcasts. That's kind of the best place to write reviews for podcasts if you could go there and write us one. The most recent one for April 2021 is by somebody named Tatumville. And thank you for highly recommending our podcast. And his review is only four words, always timely, always biblical. I'm saying his, it could be she, whoever it is. Thank you for writing us that review. And I just ask that Others of you that listen to this podcast on a regular basis, could you please give us a starred review or write something, even four words? It would be so helpful to help our content be visible to other people. Now, we only have 53 ratings for our podcast altogether, and we've been going on. It'll be our fifth year. We're getting close to 250 episodes. I'd love it if we could get to, by the end of the year, 100 ratings. That might be too much to ask um, because I know it's hard to get over there. So you don't always have time for it. But if some of you could go over there and help us reach that goal, we would be so grateful. 
for your partnership by just getting the word out. Tell a friend about this podcast. Please go on there and tell people on Apple Podcasts why they should listen. And also, if you want to read Clay Jones' article, as I said, please subscribe for 3350 at the website, or you can also at the website at any landing page for this podcast. If you go to Magazine, drop down, you'll see Postmodern Realities. Click on that. Any landing page, you can find a link where you can give us a tip. And thank you for all the ways in which you support us. Let other people know about this content. Share this content on your social media feed. We're really grateful. Thank you. Well, now I want to pivot a little bit from our discussion of specific passages in the scripture to ask you a question that you'll also, I'm just kind of posing a lot of objections you're going to get, because like I said, the whole notion of this article is probably very provocative to some people and they might feel defensive. So some people might object, some Christians might object to your thesis here, because it might sound that you've forgotten about the Protestant Reformation in the West. And so what would you say to them? Yeah, you know, that's that's such an amazing thing because it's, uh, yeah, people go, but I'm a Protestant and the whole Reformation, the Reformation was about you're not saved by your works, you're saved by grace. And and this is a, and this is part of what, of course, as you know, Melanie, this is part of the larger thing that we've been talking about. Hey, I don't get it. We're, you know, the whole Protestant Reformation is you're not saved by how good you are. Look, I encourage everybody, and I quote the first three theses of Martin Luther's uh, 95 theses that he pounded in, that he nailed to the Wittenberg door in 1517. I'm not going to go through all three of them, but I will go to the third. In the third thesis, just the, the, the key point of it, he says, but repentance does not mean inner repentance only, for there is no inner repentance that does not work outer mortifications of the flesh. And so you have Martin Luther pounding, right, nailing the 95 theses to the Wittenberg door, which was, I mean, the biggest, I mean, there were other, you know, sort of Protestant kind of things going on before that, but that's where the Protestant Reformation really began in earnest. Here he is nailing this to the door. And the third thesis is, that it can't just mean inner repentance, that it's no inner repentance if it doesn't work outward mortifications of the flesh. In other words, you're dying to self. In other words, you're changing your life. And also, uh, and as I mentioned in the article, uh, one of the lines I like that came out of the Protestant Reformation is, uh, faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone, is never alone. Uh, I think that's exactly correct. We're not talking. I'm not talking about you're saved by how good you are. I am not. What I'm talking about is that those who truly are saved, who truly come to a saving belief in Jesus, will change their lives. You know, I mean, Dallas Willard once put it, he says, never tell people to live what they believe, because people always live what they believe. And I think that's exactly correct. And again, if you really do believe that Jesus really did die on the cross and was raised from the dead, and he's coming back to judge the world, and people are going to go to one of two eternal destinies forever and ever, I know it's redundant with eternal, but they're going to go to one of two eternal destinies. If you really believe that, it will change your life. If you don't, if your life isn't changed, then you really don't believe that. And so, yeah, back again, uh, I, I really think the phrase, faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is never alone. That what you believe will change your life. And Martin Luther, as I said, said, it has to work out or outward mortifications of the flesh, or you haven't even repented. Right. But I know that there's some Christians, you know, who would say, I believe in once saved, always saved. I don't believe I can lose my salvation. I don't believe that I have to do a list of things because we're under grace now, although I just read Romans 6, so I'd say, go ahead, reread that. But, you know, what do you say to those Christians? Because they would say, but, you know, we don't lose our salvation. You know, if I prayed the prayer, I'm saved. Yeah. You know, that is, to me, one of the most fascinating conversations of all. Because that's a bastardized version of Calvinism. That's an illegitimate version of Calvinism. Let me explain something here very clearly that I don't think a lot of people get. In fact, I know a lot of people don't get this. Let me give you a story, quick story. Suppose a man is running a brothel 
and he's pimping his girls out. He's having sex with them, of course, because they're his girls. He's running a brothel. He's making a lot of money. One day uh, he turns on TV and he hears this television evangelist and he says, you know what? I'm going to hell. Everything I'm doing is wrong. And he repents and says, God, I'm sorry. He gets rid of the brothel, shuts it down, becomes an active member in his church. He starts even singing in the choir from what everybody can tell, he's just loving Jesus along with them. He is now, he, he's gotten rid of the world uh, as far as that's concerned. And then, but one day, as time goes on, he went, you know what? I had a lot more fun running a brothel. And so he goes back and he starts another brothel and he gets more girls and he's a part of trafficking them and whatever. And he's making a lot of money and he dies that way. Understand something. Calvin would say that he was never, ever saved in the first place. Arminius would say that he was saved, but he lost his salvation. But here's what everybody's missing. Both Calvin and Arminius would say that person was never saved. They would be 100% in agreement that that person was never saved. So this once saved, always saved is an illegitimate a uh, child of what some really of, of Calvinism and Calvinism was the perseverance of the saints, the P in tulip for perseverance, that the saints will persevere. But what that means is not that you're just guaranteed salvation if you prayed the prayer or once started off well. What the P means is that you will persevere in honoring God until the very end. And of course, Arminius would say, of course, you have to die living a life pleasing Christ and honoring him to the very end. So this idea of once saved, always saved, we need to drive a wooden stake through its heart because it is misleading a lot of people. And honestly, it's giving a lot of people an assurance and an emboldening them to sin. And we need to make sure that that just goes away because it's just it's a terrible idea. So. Then I want to kind of flip the coin on you as you say that, because it's very strong thoughts about, you know, saying, well, maybe somebody who's acting in this manner was never even a Christian. So that would make some of our listeners feeling extremely upset. I mean, they might think, well, I will say this, the number one question we get at the Christian Research Institute or you know, sometimes we'll get it on YouTube comments specifically on any kind of sexuality topic that we have on a particular video or answering a question about sexuality that Hank does. And that is people will be like, well, have I committed the unforgivable sin? In other words, I'm struggling and I can't give this up. I've seen it time after time after time. Someone saying, well, but I love God, but I'm struggling with porn and I just can't get, give it up. And I, I know I'll never get married. And so I'll just struggle with this. And, but it's, it, I won't be able to give it up. I and mean, literally people say this, I cannot give up the sexual sin. It's too big of a struggle. So how do you encourage those people? Because they're worried, number one, are they truly saved? Number two, they can't give this sin up. Well, you know, yeah, I hear that all the time too. And I sympathize with them. I'm very open as I think you know, Melanie, in my own blogging and stuff, I'm very open about dealing with sexual sin in my own life and getting control of pornography in particular. And my first word of encouragement to you, if you say, Guy, but I'm struggling with sin, is exactly, exactly, you're struggling with sin. You're struggling not to sin. You need to be, you know, I mean, if you look at porn, if any way it got downloaded into your computer, you delete it. If you have any kind of printed pornography, that you throw it away. You rip it into little pieces so you can never see it again that you're taking steps not to sin. You say, yeah, but then I blow it again later and I'm still, okay, I understand that. And what you need to do is you need to ask God to forgive you and then take steps not to do it again. We are all struggling with sin. The fact that you're struggling with sin is a sign that you're really a Christian. But look out, there's a huge difference between struggling with sin and continuing and often succumbing to sin. I understand that. I've sure done it a lot in my life. I get it. I've I've succumbed to it too many times in my life. But uh, I've always taken steps to not go on living that way. One of the things I did is become accountable to my wife. And I became accountable to my wife. We've been married 46 years. I think I became accountable to her 43 years ago. And boy, did that make a difference. 
very humiliating, frankly, to have to go to her and say, you know, I've sinned. And I don't necessarily suggest that you go to your wife because some women may not be able to handle it. By the way, I say wives, a lot of women are struggling with pornography too in this day and age. I've, I've, Jeannie and I've talked to them. We know women that are struggling with pornography. You need to go to somebody and say, I need help. That's one of the big things. But, you know, before I was a Christian, I didn't struggle with pornography. Here I am a 12 year old you know, I didn't struggle with pornography. I thought it was wonderful. I didn't understand why we just didn't, it wasn't every place. Now, uh, admittedly, porn back then was a lot calmer, way calmer than it is now, but it was more like, you know, a little bit worse than Swimsuit Illustrated. But I didn't understand. It wasn't until I became a Christian that I started to struggle with it. And so I think that, you know, I mean, I think we need to start taking steps to not do it. And the fact that you're struggling with it that you're trying not to do it is a sign that you really are born again. Well, before I wrap up our conversation, I think I'd like you to define what is sexual sin? Because I think that notion or the way people read what that is might be different for Christians. Like, how do you address the person who says, well, I am engaged to my boyfriend and we're Christians and we met, you know, in youth group and now we're in college and we're going to get married, you know, when we graduate from college in four years because we've gotten engaged. And so I know I'm going to marry this guy. So we are sexually active, but it's not sexual sin in the way that you're talking about porn or anything like that, because we're, I'm engaged. We're going to get married. How do you deal with those kinds of you know, explanations from people that, you know, I I wouldn't consider it if I'm engaged and I'm living with somebody and we're about to get married and our wedding's in six months, it's not sexual sin because we're getting married in six months. Well, a couple, well, several things, really. One of the things is if you're living together, you're being a bad witness. And so I want to separate living with the person you're going to marry versus having sex with the person you're going to marry, but not living with them. Because the message you're sending to non-Christians is it's okay to shack up before you get married. For sure, I'd say move, move out. On the other hand, I'd say the last couple that I married came up to me at the ceremony, and they had the full-blown ceremony, bridesmaids, groomsmen, and so on. The whole thing's going on. And he came up to me and says, by the way, we got married five months ago. He says, we just couldn't keep our hands off each other, so we got married uh, and he, because I wanted to honor God. And I think that that Frankly, I think that a lot of couples should probably do that because uh, I understand it. You want to have a right ceremony. I, well, I, then in that case, then you can use protection so that you don't get pregnant just before <laughs> just before you get married. But I think you need to understand too, though. When I run into people that say, "Well, so I can live with my fiance or not live with him," put that aside. That's a bad idea. I can have sex with my fiance because we're engaged. I think you should realize then uh, that you are married. Because historically, throughout the Old Testament, you were married. If you, if you had sex with a woman, you were married. If you had sex with a man, you were married to them. And so, you know, I, and I know, boy, I know the struggles. I, I know the struggles because I was with my wife, uh, fiance. We were together three and a half years before we officially got married, but we met in high school. We couldn't just run off and get married right away. But I think you need to take steps to not commit sexual sin. However, if you say, well, you know what? We are absolutely committed I would encourage you to go to the judge, go to a justice of the peace, get the thing signed, because I think the commitment's fine. Why? Why am I saying this? Because I think we all know that a lot of people who are engaged and who are having sex with each other, because, well, what difference does it make? Because we're engaged. All of a sudden, break off that engagement. Well, then, if you're going to say, well, we were married, so what's the big deal? Then you're adulterers, because now you're going out and going to have sex with other people when you've really, in your, according to your own statement, we're really married. It's just we haven't, we haven't gotten the piece of paper. Well, in that case, if you do separate and you do then go out and have sex with other people, then you're an adulterer or adulteress. And I think that's a terrible place that you want to be in. And so I certainly understand the pressures and the tensions there. And I would live, strive to live a, you know, a godly life. Of course, if you can't do it, see a justice of the peace and then use protection and plan your wedding as you were intending to. And don't tell anybody. This couple never told anybody. I'm, my wife and I may be the only couple that knows that they got married before they got married. So, you know, the first part of your article title says you probably aren't saved if. And so after this entire discussion, 
why don't you just say that if someone is in unrepentant sexual sin, then they are not saved? Well, you know, because they might repent. The short answer to that is because somebody listening to this may may think, you know what? That's me. I've been sleeping around. I haven't been caring. I've been telling everybody I'm a Christian. And mm-hmm. now that I've heard this, and now that I've known this is wrong, I need to repent. And they repent, and then you'll be saved. But in no sense, if you're living in unrepentant sexual sin, should you consider yourself saved? Just don't do it. Repent, uh, move out of your sharing a house, uh, sharing an apartment with somebody, move out, move on, honor God. But if you're living in unrepentant, we're talking about where you're not fighting it. You're not striving against it. By the way, just let me say one quick thing. You know, and I'm not suggesting anybody needs to do this, but this is what I did is I decided 17 years ago that if I ever looked at pornography intentionally, the language is if I ever intentionally clicked on an unambiguously naked image of a woman, that I would fast. And now, and I've written this down, I will fast for, do a six meal, no calorie fast. I'll tell you 17 years ago, 16 years ago, there was a few times that I fasted, frankly. I haven't had to fast for years. (laughs) Why? It's not worth it. And I'm not suggesting that any of your listeners, any of the people listening to this podcast necessarily do this. But what I am saying is that you do what it takes. And if you are living in unrepentant sexual sin, that you say, you know what, I'm just going to stop this. I'm not going to just give in to this. And you start to live a godly life. This is absolutely positively essential. And if you do, if you repent of your sin, and as Martin Luther said, do repent in such a way that there's outward mortification of the flesh. In other words, you're dying to self then you will be saved. And that's my hope for some of the people listening to this that may be going, you know what, I've been taking the grace of God for granted and I need to repent right now. Well, and to follow up on something Clay said about being held accountable for him, particularly it was and is his wife. But if you are a Christian striving to know God deeply and you're involved in Christian community at a a healthy, well-balanced church that teaches solid theology and preaches the gospel. And that is to be in some kind of Bible study or accountability group or have a prayer partner, because the thing about sin is it likes to hide in the darkness. It does. But if you bring it out into the light and you're in the word and you are not just in the word, because at one time I went to this sexuality conference from Harvest USA that was at my church. And they said that there was a guy that they were talking to who like was organizing orgies and he was Ugh. reading his Bible regularly. You know, it's not just that the outward, it's the heart issue. And so obviously he did not have a heart towards God. I mean, eventually he repented of all that, but I would say that you need to be in that situation because a lot of times people will say, well, I can keep this under control. Like, I will try to deal with myself watching porn, or I will try to deal with myself saying, no, like, I won't be tempted to have sex with my boyfriend or girlfriend or whoever it is. But you really need to know that someone out there is going to ask you that hard question. So where, you know, when you started going down that path with your fiance, did you guys get up and, you know, walk out of the house or do something so that you didn't get into a situation or whatever that it needs to happen? Because otherwise those kinds of things tend to stay in the darkness. I think, especially, you know, we justify things in our own mind, right? Right. When we struggle with sin, it might not be a huge, I mean, you know, sexual sin is sins of the body. So they seem a lot more serious or heavy or something, but it could be, you know, if you struggle with fear or worry or anger or something like that, we still need accountability for that. Take steps. And by the way, if you're dating, my advice to everybody dating was if you want to avoid temptation and you're just dating, don't be, here's the words, alone, alone. That was because we dated for several years before we got engaged. And, And the thing that helped us was just don't be alone, alone. Be where, you know, go out to dinner, go out with friends, go to the park, but don't be where no one can see you for sure. That's my advice. But anyway, Melanie, thank you for just emphasizing, get into an accountability group. Our church has them. I'm not in one because I'm accountable to my wife, frankly. And and being accountable to my wife is as humiliating and as big a deterrent as it could be being with several other guys who are struggling with the same thing. But yeah, get into an accountability group. I'm glad you encouraged that. Well, finally, on a much lighter note, I have some fun rapid fire questions for Clay. So Clay, how do you like your steak cooked? Medium rare, and I don't understand people that like it otherwise. 
so there. Uh, yeah, I like my steak medium rare. I can't even, people like their steak medium or well done. Okay, look, it's not a sin. It's all right. You know, I mean, uh, you know, it's kind of a burnt offering then, but whatever. What is your favorite genre of music that you like listening to? Oh, I listen to contemporary Christian. Sure. I listen to contemporary Christian. Absolutely. I think that for me, if I listen, listening to non-Christian music, you know, there's too much of this get down and do it baby stuff. It's just not helpful to me and not helpful to my sexuality. And knowing what you know now at the age that you are, what advice would you give your 18-year-old self? Huh, that's a good question. I would certainly say abide in the word, but I, you know, I was doing that honestly. I and just keep trying to be like Jesus. I don't know whether I would tell myself to do anything different because I've been walking with Jesus the whole time. I made a lot of mistakes, but the Lord used those mistakes to educate me. I committed, oh, I'll tell you one, Melanie. I would tell myself, do not flirt with other women. Now that opens up a thing, but I would say, do not flirt with other women because I used to be quite a flirt, frankly, and I thought it was cute. And my wife even you know, knew about it and she'd see me doing it, I'd kind of flirt. And I thought, oh, there's nothing. I regret that deeply. I consider that to be a great sin uh, because I made people, frankly, sometimes I know that it caused women not to be first and foremost in love with their spouses. And that was, that was really bad. So there's what I would say. I would tell myself, do not flirt with other women. Even like I said, I wasn't being sexual. I wasn't saying, Hey, you want to go and do it, but I'd just be cute. And I thought it was cute and kind of funny. That was bad. It was destructive. And honestly, it's one of the biggest regrets of my life because I know sometimes I've influenced women in a way they shouldn't have been influenced. And if you didn't have to sleep, what would you do with your extra time? If I didn't have to sleep, what would I do? I guess I'd nap. No, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I mean, I, I, I guess I would uh, uh, write more. I, I would write more. You know, I keep, I'm writing a lot. I, I blog a lot at ClayJones.net, uh, but I would probably write more. I'm, I'm pretty busy writing as it is, but that's probably what I would be doing. Well, thanks, Clay, for being a guest on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Pleasure, as always, to be with you, Melanie, and I thank God for your ministry. You've been listening to Episode 233 of the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest has been Dr. Clay Jones, who's written a Viewpoint article in the current print edition, Volume 44, Number 1 of the Christian Research Journal. His article is called, You Probably Aren't Saved If This Is About Sex. You can read his article when you subscribe to our magazine at our website, Equip.org. We'd like to connect to you, so please subscribe to the Bible Answer Man YouTube channel and join in the conversation in the comments section and in the live chat when we have premiere videos. Please follow the Bible Answer Man page on Facebook and on Twitter. You will find us at Hank Hanegraaff, Bible Answer Man, Christian Research Institute, and Christian Research Journal, as well as on Instagram at the Bible Answer Man account. You won't want to miss every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern when we live stream the Bible Answer Man broadcast, hosted by CRI President Hank Canegraaff at our website, equip.org. In addition, please subscribe to the Hank Unplugged podcast. Hank gets out of the studio and into his study and engages in in-depth, free-flowing, essential Christian conversations on critical issues with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people on the planet. You'll want to head on over to Equip.org because there you're going to find thousands of free resources for you in articles and past broadcasts, our podcasts, and videos. And thank you for all the ways in which you partner with the Christian Research Institute. Mm-hmm.